Started down the Merry Max when he done the hay. It was a pleasant journey till I heard the captain say, Cock your ears and man, you sweep my heart with milk of bread. Those are the pocket balls a lying dead ahead. Gonna earn a dollar, gonna find a gal. Hauling down to Boston on the Middlesex Canal. Pulled up to the landing and the captain paid the toll. I said, we gotta go up hill. He said, well, that's my soul. We'll boost her up and down the lock. It's twenty locks in all. Then let her down at Boston Town and in between we'll haul. Gonna earn a dollar, gonna find a gal. Hauling down to Boston on the Middlesex Canal. We reached the Concord River, it was windy, deep and wide. This horse can't walk on water, how will we see out the side? We'll use the float and tow fast as a captain with a grin. This nag of mine, she knows the way, just mind you don't fall in. We're gonna earn a dollar, gonna find a gal, all and down to Boston on the Middlesex Canal. Crossed the Shawshine Aqueduct like floating in the air. We ran the locks at Wolver just like going down the stair. We spent the night beside Horn Pond and then we're on our way. I'll find a gal in Charlestown when we sell this load of hay. Gonna earn a dollar, gonna find a gal. All and down to Boston on the Middlesex Canal. Gonna earn a dollar, gonna find a gal. All and down Boston on the Middlesex Canal. Welcome, everybody. And uh, just a reminder to the gentleman in the room, happy Valentine's Day Eve. <laughs> Welcome to the Burbine Lecture Series and the Wuben Historical Society joint program, Middlesex Canal, America's first interstate then and now. I am Bill Campbell, and I am the program director of the Burbine Lecture Series. Before I start, I wanted to tell you that that song was sung by uh, troubadour Paul Wigan. Uh, he was singing Hauling Down to Boston, and you can find that on the Middlesex Canal Association website. You'll hear a lot about them tonight, uh, a wonderful website and a wonderful museum at North Borica, and we really relied on uh, them for this presentation. Some Burbine business before we begin. Tonight is the first of four more Burbine lectures this spring. We have these program cards out on the tables in the foyer. The remaining programs will be hosted at the Joyce Middle School Auditorium on Locust Street. Our next program is next Thursday, February 23rd. That had been rescheduled to that night from last fall. Um, the topic is Italy, a journey from Venice to Tuscany, Rome, Naples, and the Amalfi Coast. The longtime president of the Burbine series, Mel Lieberman, who passed away last fall, always cautioned me about scheduling programs in January and February because of the potential for snow. Also, my grandfather's birthday was February 14th, and there is a family legend that it always snows heavily around his birthday. So throwing caution to the wind, I scheduled two lectures in February as bookends to my grandfather's birthday. So if you have any influence up there, Mel, which I am sure you do, and I know you were with us this weekend, can you hold off on any snow until we get through these two lectures? It will come as no surprise to you that tonight's topic was the brainchild of our friend John McElhaney. With so many events around the city every week, John and I had talked over the past few years about joining the Historical Society with the Burbine Lecture as a way to make it easier for you to enjoy our programs. This is the third time that the Historical Society and the Burbine Series have joined forces to present a program about Woburn's rich history. John always liked the concept of then and now with photographs. Of course, with the life of the Middlesex Canal spanning the period from 1793 to 1859, there really are no photographs of the canal in operation and very few remnants of the canal remaining. With the generous help of the Woburn Public Library, particularly archivist Tom Doyle, and the wonders of Google searches, and some fine research at the Baker Museum at Harvard University, 
and the Middlesex Canal Museum in Billerica, we have assembled a series of photographs, drawings, and documents which will give you a sense of the life and impact of the Middlesex Canal in Woburn. Now the canal ran from the Merrimack River in Chelmsford all the way down to Boston. But our focus tonight will be mainly on the canal in Woburn, because as we all know, this is the hub of the universe. You will hear from two principal speakers tonight. First, Bob McGuire, who you know from past historical society lectures, will talk about the building and the workings of the canal. Then Woburn City Engineer Jay Corey will present some images of the canal superimposed on a satellite map of the Woburn and will present compelling comments on where the canal was constructed and some of the obstacles that the builders faced. Finally, I wrap up the program with some later day photographs and comments on the ultimate demise of the Middlesex Canal. Now sit back, relax, and let's welcome Bob McGuire for a journey down the old Middlesex Canal. Bob? Thank you, Bill. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ready for the first one? <laughs> Bill's supposed to be taking care of this one. Good start. Before we talk about the Middlesex Canal itself, it is important to recognize what circumstances spawned its need. Following the Revolutionary War, business and political le leaders realized the opportunities that inland waterways could bring to both expanding business and bringing the country closer together. They had seen the advantages of these waterways in England and France. In addition, the effects of the Industrial Revolution in England were now reaching America, and new industries required better modes of transportation. Seen here is the Bridgewater Canal in Manchester, England. Note the aqueduct and the boat being pulled by a horse across a river. This canal was completed in 1767, and its primary purpose was to link the coal mines of Worsley to Manchester 10 miles away. Because of the speed and cost effectiveness of the canal, Canal coal costs, excuse me, coal costs in Manchester were halved. The canal was opened for business 35 years before the opening of the Middlesex Canal. The United States had no system of maintained roadways during this period. All goods were transported by horse and wagon. While this mode of transportation was viable for local vendors, such as this grocer traveling along Warren Avenue, Speed and volume were requirements for the transporting of major resources like timber. It was vital that these commodities could be transported to commerce centers like Boston for distribution to all parts of the country and the world. Likewise, imports could not get to the customers in outlying territories in an easy and efficient manner. Beginning with the expanding transportation systems, the United States transformed itself into an economic and industrial power throughout the 19th century. Canal systems were merely the first but important steps in this evolution. The industrial age in America produced dramatic changes in the country and revolutionized how we did business. Industrial processes were revamped and new and exciting inventions promised a better future for all. The recreation of new ways to transport goods opened up vast new opportunities for commerce. Lowell was an early beneficiary of the canal. Textile mills, as pictured here, flourished. So it wasn't surprising that some enterprising entrepreneurs set out to connect Boston, the hub of commerce in the Northeast, with outlying districts that were looking for a fast and efficient means to receive and send goods and materials. The emergence of Lowell and Lawrence as industrial cities, with the creation of its textile mills and its elaborate canals, serves as an example of how efficient transportation systems, coupled with the emerging technologies of the Industrial Revolution, stimulated economic progress. Does anybody know what this is? Very good. Good history students here. In 1793, Eli Whitney, born in Westboro, Mass., designed and constructed a cotton gin, a machine that separated cotton seed from the cotton fiber. It revolutionized the cotton industry. Raw cotton would come up the canal 
and finished goods would be sent down the canal to eagle, eager and profitable markets. This is but one example of the impact made by the Middlesex Canal. So now we know why the canal was needed. How did it get built? In 1793, James Sullivan, Loamy Baldwin, and several investors were given a charter by Governor John Hancock, quote, for the purpose of cutting a canal from the waters of Merrimack River into the waters of Medford River, end quote. When completed, it provided the major link for a continuous water passage from Boston to Concord, New Hampshire. This legislation, however, came with a few restrictions. Specific toll rates were assigned, a specific number of shares and how they could be voted were determined, and water could be only drawn from the Concord River. Detailed prohibitions against utilizing the Shawsheen River were also written into the legislation. When completed, the canal stretched 27 and a quarter miles from Boston, approximately beginning at the current site of Bunker Hill Community College, traversing through Charlestown, Medford, Winchester, Woburn, Wilmington, Billerica, and finally ending at what is now Chelmsford. It contained 20 locks, some 50 bridges, and eight aqueducts, and was hailed as the greatest engineering feat of the day. According to his report to the Board of Directors in 1803, James Sullivan, now president of the corporation, reported that it cost $444,000 to build the canal, and at the time was the largest canal in America. In this first half of the presentation, we're going to focus on the entire project of the building of the canal, and later we'll review that part of the canal that flowed through Woburn. Basically, I'm going to give the history, and Jay's going to come up and do the sizzle. <laughs> James Sullivan was a leading businessman, politician, and entrepreneur of his day. A future governor of Massachusetts, for whom Sullivan Square is named, he became president of the corporation. He was a judge at the Supreme Judicial Court, attorney general of the Commonwealth, and envisioned the nation connected by canals. While Benjamin Thompson, also known as Count Rumford, and Loamy Baldwin were probably, and still are, Wuben's two most famous citizens, Loamy Baldwin is clearly the most honored. He was a leading citizen, politician, businessman, and soldier who led the Wuben militia into the battlefield of Lexington and Concord in April 1775. It was the Wuben militia that fought the British at the Bloody Angle, a pivotal battle on that April morning. He was a true revolutionary war hero, but he was also a very accomplished man of many talents. Loemi Baldwin was a graduate of Harvard College, excelled at mathematics, and became a civil engineer. Because of his engineering expertise, he was named superintendent for the construction of the canal. He also dabbled in horticulture, found a new species of apple on a neighboring farm, and because of his development and propagation of the fruit, it became known as the Baldwin Apple. To begin this project, private funds needed to be raised. Early invested in investors included John Adams, his son John Quincy Adams, and even the governor, John Hancock, who also signed the legislation incorporating the proprietors of the Middlesex Canal. John Hancock died in office in 1793. Do you think there would be uproar today if Governor Patrick signed legislation into law that auto authorized the venture, then invested in the project? <laughs> Remember, we were a young country. Our leaders were the landowners and businessmen, and conflict of interest was not so easily defined. 800 shares of stock in the corporation were offered in 1794, holding back 200 shares for a later offering. The price rose to $473 a share in 1803 and topped $500 a share in the next year. By 1816, the price had fallen to $300 a share. Between 1793 and 1817, shareholders were assessed a total of $740 per share. Dividends were not paid until 1819. 
By the time that the company was officially bankrupt in 1859, shareholders had been paid dividends totaling $559.50 per share. Financially, the project was a failure. But engineering-wise, it was a daring and monumental success. And it brought, in today's jargon, a successful stimulus package to the economy. This page excerpt from the Canal Stock Ledger shows that John Quincy Adams purchased 13 shares. Although an accomplished and well-regarded engineer, Loemi Baldwin had no experience constructing canals. He learned on the job, but he also consulted experts in the field and traveled across the country to seek out the best canal experts. He engaged an Englishman, Samuel Weston, who was building canals in Pennsylvania to survey the proposed route. Mr. Weston also considered the leading expert in the field and had utilized leading edge surveying equipment. Based on his measurement, this plan of land owned by the Middlesex Canal Corporation of Woburn was prepared. The legislation authorizing the building of the canal provided the company with the ability to take land by eminent domain. In the end, the company purchased 142 parcels of land, but only 16 required use of the eminent domain statute. The legislation was clear to note that the corporation had to make, quote, full and adequate payment for all land purchased and do it quickly so that a landowner could take their grievance to court if they felt reimbursement was unfair. Each parcel was carefully noted in this updated Middlesex Canal Corporation document. While difficult to read, it lists the name of the landowner, the location of the land, and the amount of acreage. No, it doesn't show how much that was paid for it. After the engineering and surveying was completed, the task of digging the canal began. The primary resources for accomplishing this feat were this shovel, and hundreds of laborers. There were actually picks and other materials that Jay will talk about later, but this is basically how the canal was dug. But many large rocks and boulders required excavation, and when man, horse, or oxen could not remove it, gunpowder was used. Unfortunately, some men were killed as a result of explosions. It would be many years before Alfred Bode Nobel would patent a safer way to detonate dynamite with blasting caps and fuses. Tall aquatic grasses grew in and around the canal, and men with scythes had to clear the environs of the canal each year. Mink and musquashes, or muskrats, constantly burrowed into the banks of the canal, undermining them. Bounties were put on their heads by the company. While the entire body was required for payment, Trappers kept the furs. Work was discontinued during the winter, usually from December 1st until April 1st. The rugged winters produced chilling frost that impeded digging and necessary masonry work. But it did provide a gathering place for local skaters, as it did for many years thereafter. While this is not a picture of the Middlesex Canal, many of you did skate on the Middlesex Canal. Water for the canal came mainly from the Concord River. While the canal would never have been built had it not been for the Merrimack River and its access to the north, not a drop of water to maintain the canal ever came from the Merrimack. This legislative act demanded it. Supplemental water was sometimes drawn from streams along the way. The Horn Pond Brook was one of those employed. Visualize the Concord River in North Brewerica as the starting point of the flow of water for the canal. It was 107 feet above the water level to Boston and 25 feet above the Mer Merrimack River. So simple, just let the water flow downhill. Well, in fact, it wasn't that easy. And when Jay gets to his point, he's going to talk about how the locks work and the flow of water, and it was not an easy process. What seemed to be an insurmountable obstacle were the constant and consistent leaking canal banks. The project was at least 20 years ahead of the cement industry in the United States. 
The preferred method for addressing this issue was a process called puddling, which was tamping clay with water in, in order to create a semi-plastic state. It was expensive, and Loemi Balden adapted a cheaper process. Considering the banks had to be at a 33 degree angle, it was an ingenious and workable method, but it often required constant repairs. This was another cost-saving measure that eventually contributed to the canal's demise. The canal was built to specific dimensions. It would be 30 to 30 and a half feet wide at the water's surface, 20 feet at the bottom, and the sides would angle up at 33 degrees. The depth of the water would be two and a half to three and a half feet, and the towpath would be 10 feet wide, and it was to be higher than the water's surface. A large labor force was required, and the company did not pay well. Manpower came from all over the region, and these laborers were boarded along the canal at company barracks. The cost for boarding and feeding the men were deducted from their pay. There were many labor issues that erupted. This corporation payroll book was the attendance record of the day. Canal payroll records indicate that a Benjamin Taylor, a laborer, received $11 for 22 days of work. As you view the picture, this picture of the canal, think about the labor involved in digging that canal. Often the company would sublet sections of the canal construction to local men. An interesting labor issue resulted from one of these local farmers. The following request was made by Loemi Baldwin to the directors of the company. Quote, the petition of Benjamin Douse humbly shows that he undertook to dig and make 250 rods for $13.50 per rod which amounts to $3,375. That the work proved of different magnitude from his calculations from obstructions that could not be foreseen by him. That instead of the sum of the contract, the job has cost him $4,592. Besides his own trouble and attention to taking care of it. He therefore prays the said proprietors to consider his case to make him such further allowance as they shall find proper, so as to save him and his family from distress, which might otherwise come on him by his attendance to the work of the canal, the unknown disadvantages of which he did not and could not calculate against." End quote. So the company took his request under consideration, and in their generosity, the company paid Mr. Dulce an additional $500 so that as loss might not be so great. In addition, the company recognized Mr. Douse's son, who had been, quote, indefatigable and labored hard in the job and had been exposed to cold and wet, end quote. They rewarded him with a complete outfit. In case you think that this was a heartless company, I offer this second story from the same report. The superintendent wrote to the directors on May 27, 1802, Quote, the workmen have exerted themselves of late and have with the greatest cheerfulness gone into the water many times up to their armpits and continued wet for whole days together. He asked if he could promise some kind of treat on the ensuing 4th of July with liberty to suspend their work for a few hours on some part of the day to enjoy it. Would not this have a good effect in stimulating them to greater exertions, he asked. Boy, aren't you feeling patriotic right about now? <laughs> Interestingly enough, Independence Day, which celebrates the adoption of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, only became a federal holiday in 1871, and it was an unpaid holiday for federal workers. It became a paid holiday in 1941. Before we proceed any further, we should look at the various systems that made the canal work. I'm not going to go through these very in much detail because Jay is going to go through them when his portion comes. But I want you to get a picture of them. The canal packet boat had a peculiar shape since it was designed to carry heavy and large loads and navigate in both canal and river environments. They were about 75 feet long and 9 feet in the middle. It was flat bottomed, it could carry 20 ton tons of cargo. 
Some had sails and oars. There were smaller versions of the boat and were used for shorter routes or smaller loads. The packet boats were usually towed by rope by a single horse, but heavier loads sometimes required oxen and a lead horse. The many locks required to, in order to raise or lower the rivers, excuse me, lower the canal's water level, adapting to the terrain. The greatest drop occurred, occurred along Horn Pond in Woburn. The eight aqueducts were a marvel in engineering. While the use of aqueducts is commonly associated with the Romans, its origins go back to the Greeks and Near East cultures. These aqueducts not only brought water overhead, but did so to transport the packet boats and horses over rivers and streams. Don't forget, the Concord River was the only main source of flowing water. Therefore, the canal water needed to be hauled over the rivers such as the Shawsheen. While the pillars were made of stone, the rest of the aqueduct was made of wood. Once again, this cost-saving measure would come back to haunt the project because of the many repairs that were required. While there were few maintained roads along the route of the canal, there were many landowners. Often the canal would cut the landowner's property so that access was not available to travel from one portion of his property to another. Eminent domain was one thing, but inability to access one's property was another. Angry landowners could halt the project, and many did try. Bridges had to be erected. This idyllic scene depicts the estate of Loemi Baldwin. Note on the right, he needed a bridge to pass over the canal to other parts of his property. So if Loemi got a bridge, anybody else got a bridge that needed it. By the way, they were known as accommodation bridges. Authorizing legislation for the construction of the canal included many provisions. Pictured here is a copy of the regulations relative to the navigation of the Middlesex Canal. This particular version was written in 1830. It outlined a number of rules and penalties for violating those rules. The highest fine, however, was capped at $10. There were rules for boat size, passing another boat raft, limitations of banding of rafts, number of men required for each type of vessel, and of course, rules for payment of fees. While the canal was a more efficient and faster than any other mode of travel, a speed limit was determined. It was four miles per hour. No boat or raft could pass through a lock after dark, determined to be 7 p.m. in the spring and autumn and 9 p.m. in the summer. On bright moonlit evenings, the curfew was lifted until 10 p.m. Sunday travel was allowed on the canal, but places of public worship could not be disrupted, quote, nor occasion any noise to interrupt the tranquility of the day. No single horn could be blown on Sunday. To gain additional revenue, passengers were added. One could travel the length of the canal for 75 cents. If you left at 8 a.m. from Billerica, you could arrive in Boston before nightfall. Oh, we laugh now. I bet they enjoyed that trip. <laughs> For those who wanted to splurge, the large boat, the Washington, could provide a more luxurious trip for $1.12. This boat was covered to protect passages from the rain and had two spacious rooms. There were always times that a boat would have to stop because darkness fell before a trip was completed. There were many taverns along the way that provided suitable food, drink, and lodging. I can't prove this, but I bet Wuben had more taverns than anyone else. <laughs> this picture shows a rustic landing station named the Bark House along the canal at Abbott Street, beside the Wuben Public Library. A later, later Linskit rendering of the location lists, lists it as Abbott's Landing. It took nine years to construct the canal. The work was hampered by work stoppages during the harsh winters, labor issues, poor equipment, lack of appropriate blasting material, and unwise cost savings during construction that required constant repairs, and no one in charge with experience in constructing canals. Yet it was completed within the 10-year time limit set by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the only canal to do so. 
The canal opened for business in 1803. In its heyday, the canal carried raw materials such as timber, coal, salts, and raw cotton. Finished goods were supplied to outlying districts. The canal was a boon to the economy. While the movement of goods may have been the primary impetus for building of the canal, Wuben benefited from it in another way. It brought vacationers to the resort town of Wuben and the beautiful shores of Horn Pond. Located along the canal in a view of the pond sat the Horn Pond House at a site on a promontory on Arlington Road. Travelers found a destination for relaxation and country life. For many years, the Horn Pond House flourished. In this artist's rendition, you see an idealized picture of a boat coming through the upper Horn Pond locks with the Horn Pond House in the background. The Middlesex Canal entered Woburn after passing Wedge Pond and Winter Pond in Winchester. It traveled along the southern banks of Horn Pond through a series of locks that was raised some 50 feet. They were called the Stoddard Locks, named for the superintendent who oversaw them. The canal traversed along the pond of what is now Arlington Road, formerly known as Canal Street, for obvious reasons. You see a picture of the bowling alley in this particular rendition. I thought that was a nice touch. My portion of the presentation ends here. Jay Corey, Woburn City Engineer, will take you on a trip along the canal in Woburn with the assistance of some modern technology. But before I turn the program over to him, I want to acknowledge the tremendous resources gained from the archives of the Middlesex Canal Association in Bill Ricker. We have merely scratched the surface of interesting information on the canal, and you are urged to visit the museum. In addition, I want to recognize Wuben's own Len Harmon, who has spent a lifetime documenting the history of the canal, and through his indomitable spirit, has kept the memory of the canal alive. Len, I believe you're here. Could you stand if you are? Where are you, Len? Is Len here? Yes. Give him a hand. Thank you, Len. Jay, I've warmed them up for you. They're ready for you. Thank you, my friend. I go up there. It's interesting what Bob was talking about. Is that better? There we go. It's called Changed and Latent Field Conditions, when a contractor encounters something under the ground that they didn't know was there previously. They're entitled to go for what's called a change order under their construction contract. And it sounds as though the uh, gentleman who was being paid X number of dollars per rod of, of length of canal uh, suffered damages and uh, it went to arbitration before the uh, canal commissioners and they opted to give him half of what he was looking for. Interesting stuff. To follow along the lines of, well, before we begin, before I begin, the reason I'm here is I was invited to be a part of this by my friend, a lot of people's friends, John McElhaney, um, which meant a lot to me to, to do this this time because uh, John was a wonderful man. Uh, we've talked about sources of information. Uh, Bob mentioned um, Harvard Library, the Baker Library. They are the repository of uh, Laomi Baldwin's papers. Um, there are a lot of interesting things there. The best source I found is actually the University of Lowell, um, their Center for Lowell History. They have all of the Middlesex Canal records, construction records, plans, specifications of more interest. Uh, obviously, the library has pictures. Everybody has a little bit. The uh, Middlesex Canal Association is a wonderful repository that brings a lot of these things together. We'll talk about some of the things as we go along. There we go. Uh, some of the things that Bob already mentioned, 1792 to 1793, we have Laomi Baldwin going out and doing surveys, trying to find um, a good route for the Middlesex Canal. He actually found a couple of alternatives. The survey equipment that he was using back at that time was less than uh, what was needed, and there was a bust of about 40 feet in his survey. The canal people actually go out and hire Weston, whom they found in Philadelphia, 
working on another project, he comes out with his survey instruments, uh, does a much better um, survey of the actual route and finds it to be 107 feet, as Bob mentioned, from the Concord down to mean sea level. We'll show you some of Vince's instruments. What was interesting is um, even though he provided consultation and advice to the uh, canal directors, they were in awe of his bill, which was in excess of $2,163, which they opted to pay slowly, but they decided they weren't going to hire him for any further discussion on the canal. So he was thrown off. Uh, Weston did look at two routes. One was through Wilmington, Chelmsford, Wilmington, Bill Rickard, Wilmington, and Woburn. And one was through Stoneham and Reading. It was actually a better route because it had uh, less locks to it. However, when the people in Stoneham and Reading were approached about bringing a canal through their town, they were concerned about how the industrialization of their community would affect them. So they opted not to be a part of it. 200 years later, when the city of Woburn is having an interchange put in at Commerce Way, the town of Reading was act, asked if they wanted to participate. They said no. So again, we have these forms of transportation going back 200 years that the city has embraced, which has brought industrial and commercial uh, entities to the community, which has helped their base over the years, um, and others decided not to. Length of the canal, 27 and a quarter miles, primary source was the Concord River. There is one place, and we'll show it to you later, as Bob mentioned, where you could take secondary water for filling the canal from Horn Pond, and that was just below uh, the bottom lock at Winchester. The uh, canal itself is approximately 30 feet wide at the top, two and a half feet deep, 20 feet wide at the bottom, had a 10-foot towpath. The locks were 12 to 14 feet wide. So in the canal, you could have two boats pass each other. In the locks, it was only one boat at a time. All the locks were about 75 feet long, and they varied in depth from 10 feet down to about 8 feet. If you take the 107-foot drop from the Concord River down to uh, Boston, divided by the number of locks of 20, you get an average drop through the locks of about 5 and a half feet per lock. Extending the total distance, which we'll get into later, the total hydraulic grade, that is, the, if you were to take uh, the total hydraulic drop from uh, the Concord all the way to Boston, is about seven hundredths of a foot per hundred feet, which is, in all consideration, flat. Let's look at some of the instruments that we had in 1800 for doing survey. And again, these are Weston's instruments. Um, on my right, which would be your left, now that I've established the benchmark, I know which way to go. This is a, uh, an early survey compass. In the middle, we have a compass tripod, and they would mount this on the tripod, they would level it, and they would do their sighting, and they would take a compass reading, and they would write that down. That's a 66-foot survey chain, which two individuals would stretch out. There's 100 links to a chain. There's one rod to every 16 and a half feet, and there's four rods to a chain. And this is how they took measurements back then. Essentially, one mile was 320 rods. So after they go out and they survey all the routes, they have their field books. And their field books like, look like this. Physical features on the left and right, and all of their notes, this would be the bearing, which would be the compass reading, the distance and rods, and the elevation. And then they would go back to the office and they would take all this information, and they would plot it on a plan. Uh, this is actually a typical plan. This actually shows the uh, uh, 1829 as-built survey, but it's a good example of how they plotted things. You can see what is now Elm Street up in North Woburn. This used to be Main Street. Then the canal comes right down across Elm Street. Down here is Lowell Street. Right up in here, you see a little um, leg coming off the canal. That was an inlet for uh, Baldwin Landing. Just north of that was the accommodation bridge. Now, you saw an idealized uh, picture that showed the English gardens and the uh, mansion off to the left. The mansion was actually some 
900 feet away, uh, essentially the length of a football field, so not quite as close as it showed. Here we have um, that little ticket there says that I got this from the Baker Library. Um, they don't let you photograph without taking those things. This is a profile. That is, if we took that plan and we sliced it and looked at the plan sideways, this is what we would see for topography. This is Horn Pond. Everything is referenced off the base of the Concord River, which is this line up here. So they take the Concord River and they drop elevations. From the Concord River to Horn Pond is 73.9 feet. Try and figure out what is the mean water elevation of Concord River, that's a little bit difficult. What they did is they had a mark on a, uh, on a granite column up there that they used as their benchmark and everything was referenced off of that. When we get to Boston, we have mean sea level. So those are the references, those are the elevation difference. This was an alternative profile. Now, this survey was done in 1793, updated by Weston in 1794. So we see two different things. We see one path along Horn Pond. We see an alternative path, which is a little bit flatter. As we see later, this was kind of going around the hill rather than coming down uh, Canal Street or Arlington Road as we know it today, neither of which existed at the time of, of this survey. James Watt creates the steam engine in about 1763. He goes into business uh, with uh, Bolton, and they produce the first commercial steam engine in 1763. We see that over to your left. Now, at the time, they have this wonderful machine, and they say, well, what we can do with it? Well, they have all these mills. They do textiles. They can turn things. So this becomes the primary driving machine for all the industrialization in, uh, in Europe, beginning in England. Great stuff for putting to construction equipment. Unfortunately, the first steam engine, which is actually right here, we have a, a picture of it, it survived. This was made in 1839, so totally unavailable at the time they built the canal. And as Bob said, the primary tools of the day are the wheelbarrow, the little cart, picks, shovels, and rakes. And the only engine available is oxen and horse, which they did utilize. Now, when you read the records, and I haven't come across it, but they did say that they formulated one tipping cart, which they used to move larger volumes of earth. So I imagine that they could move up to two and three yards of material at a time. Later on in the presentation, we'll tell you how much material these folks actually moved by hand. This would be a, uh, a typical sketch of what it looked like to build a canal. And people did wear top hats and uh, beaver hats and the like. But essentially, it was all hand labor. You have a, a wheelbarrow. You have picks and shovels and carts. Uh, I doubt very often you'd see people sitting down because they would not get paid. This is a picture from an actual picture from canal construction in Utah uh, right about 1868. Again, we see um, horses and uh, manual labor. So we, when we consider what we had 200 years ago and what we have today, major mechanical earth moving equipment, in 200 years we've come a long way. Back in 1800, they were still using the tools that they used 46 centuries previous in building the pyramids. So, as they say, we've come a long way, baby. All right, a short tour along the um, canal. Now, these are our uh, aerial photographs of the city. This is Wilmington up here. I'm, I'm going to go sit over here with Bill and kind of point this out as we get down. Uh, let me point out some. Okay, this is the landfill up in North Woburn. It's the Alta Vista School. This is Main Street, for a little field. A lot of you are familiar with the canal from School Street down because that's one of the more prominent areas. Uh, it's very visible to the community. I think everybody's seen it. Uh, up here, uh, it's a little bit less visible. It's kind of like gone in through here. There's a little section up 
prior to Wilmington uh, that's still in existence. But again, I think the, the best part is from School Street looking south, this is a view of it. Um, on the left side, I have to turn around, this is horrible. Here we go, on the left side, this is the towpath. Now again, you see a lot of saplings and, and whatnot. As Bob indicated previously, annually, they would have to go through and brush the saplings. They'd have to brush it from the banks, they'd have to brush it from the towpaths, and they'd have to uh, brush it from the puddled gutter. This holds about two and a half feet of water currently. So it's very close to what it used to be 200 years ago. Here we have the canal at Alfred Street looking north up towards Ferrillo Field. You can see the, on the left the yellow dwelling. That's the 1790 house where it's been relocated adjacent to the canal. Originally it was situated where the uh, rotary to 128 is. So it's actually been moved twice. It was moved to just off of Main Street north of the, uh, of the interchange and then when they built Sierra Suites Hotel they moved it adjacent to the um, to the canal uh, just above Kiwanis Park, which is a wonderful place because it's near where they moved the old Baldwin Mansion. Right up in here is the remnants of the accommodation bridge and the inlet that went to the Baldwin Mansion. We'll see that a little bit better in the aerials as we go on. Next section of the route goes from uh, Alfred Street across the highway as you can see, the old Baldwin Mansion would have been in this area here. Main Street wasn't there at the time. Elm Street was Main Street. The little uh, jut in is right about here, and the accommodation bridge was right there. And those abutments are still there today. We can actually go out and physically say there's the abutments to the old bridge, and there's the inlet from the canal to the Baldwin area. From there, across crosses the highway, goes down to about Lowell Street. This is at Middlesex Canal Park, looking north towards the highway. On the left is the, um, uh, the existing hotel. On the right, again, we have the towpath. Its vegetation is covered over. This is a very good example of the uh, canal down through that stretch. This is looking just over the, uh, the reproduction of the bridge that was constructed there of timber uh, to look like one of the old bridges on the canal. This is looking south from uh, Canal Park. Here we are at Lowell Street. This is looking north, backed up towards the highway. To the left, if any of you are familiar with uh, where Lenny Harmon resides, his house is over to the left. What you see there, um, this has been tremendously narrowed down. Uh, once the old bridges were taken out and this became a um, an unused area, they culverted the bridges and reconstructed the roadway bridges with that red, red brick that we see. And that's typical about the time period of 18, late 1850s uh, when the canal became defunct. Here we are at Lowell Street looking south. If any of you are familiar with the blue house on the right, that's where John Curran lives. Again, a very uh, a good stretch of the uh, canal. We're fortunate in that from School Street all the way down to uh, almost Middlesex Street, remnants of the canal are very close to what they were many, many years ago. And, it, and it's a wonderful asset to have in the community. Uh, from here, we go from Lowell Street down to about Library Field. Here's Library Field here. Now, what we are showing for route here from here on down is not quite what shows on the uh, Mass Historical Commission's archaeological survey, which we know to be correct from the field notes of the 1829 survey. But we're showing this because we had, uh, up until we started researching this for the lecture this evening, we were using the old 1906 Walker maps. Because remnants from this area south to Winchester really don't exist. So we don't have any physical features of where the canal ran in this area. So we had two possible paths down here. 
Before I get there, this is Hart Street, where a lot of you uh, used to skate when you were younger. I know that Yarby did. He was mentioning that. This is a good look of where the skating area was behind Hart Street near the Boys Club. Here we are at Kilby Street, looking north uh, next to the apartments. Um, the railroad actually came through this area and disturbed a lot of the canal. All we see is the old red road bed here. And again, this is the road bed going down uh, at uh, Middlesex Street. Here's the interesting part. Again, we know that the canal actually came through here down Arlington Road, just as we see here. But we found all these finger islands and an alternative route. And if you think back to that profile that I showed you uh, from the Baldwin survey of, of 1793, we showed two routes. One was along what is now Arlington Road, and the other one was in very close proximity to the route that we have shown here. So this gave us pause as to they may have looked at that alternative route. They may have run into um, unreasonable compensation requests by the landowners in that area. There could have been any number of impediments that we haven't quite figured out as yet. These are the 1906 Walker maps. Now, these were produced in the early 1900s, a mere 50 years after the canal had become defunct and, and gone away. So they would have known something. The cartographers at that time did a lot of research. As we see, it's true to form. Here's the uh, railroad as it was in existence. The canal runs along it, and then here it goes up to Wilmington. This is the route that we know because physically it's still there. Now we get down to where we come into Library Field. Uh, once again, here's the canal route, true to form. Here's the railroad, but they show it veering off where there was a stream through this area. This was known as Town Meadow. It was a very low, flat, um, swampy area, if you will. And I talked to one individual who indicated, yes, this was where they used to, uh, it was a landing, and the boats would pull in there, and they would stay there for the night, or they could turn them around. Seemed very plausible. And then the, uh, it continued down along um, what's called Town Meadow Brook. Here we have the 1829 uh, as-built survey, which we were able to obtain through Lenny Harmon and his people, who I can't say enough about, by the way. Uh, I know that Lenny's been working on this as a labor of love for 30, 40 years. I first got involved in the Middlesex Canal. I grew up in Watertown. I didn't know what a Middlesex Canal was. There was the Charles River. We weren't even in your water basin. When I was a young engineer, immediately out of college, I was working with Green International. We were doing a town-wide drainage study in Bill Ricca. I found a hydraulic connection from it through Iron Horse Park, which is the big railroad park, which had obliterated most of the canal in that area. But there was a trough that ran from the Concord River to the Shawsheen River. I went to my boss, I said, how could this be? How could you connect two different rivers of different elevation? He explained the, the old Middlesex Canal. So that's when I first got involved. That was some close to 40 years ago now. And when I came to work as a, in, in, as a private engineer in Woburn, I, I saw more of it, and I became interested. As the city engineer, I got to research at my office, and I've been fascinated with it. I wish that I had the time to dedicate more. People like Len, who have kept it alive, kept the, uh, the, the remnants that we have special, are special people. At any rate, here is Town Meadow. This is the brook that comes across from Wind Street. This is the brook that we saw on the 1906. Here is a large embankment that it doesn't quite show exactly. We'll show you a, a picture of what it actually looks like. They built this uh, and stomped uh, just short of the winter. The embankment was close to 22 feet tall. Through this type of environment, if you remember when we constructed the police station back in 1996, they piled massive amounts of dirt there. That was to surcharge the uh, peat and the underlying materials which were highly compressible. Well, they didn't know about all the peat there at the time, or maybe they did, and that's why they didn't cross the swamp. At any rate, when they came back in the, in the spring, the 22-foot high embankment was down to ground level. 
it all settled. But they compressed the peak, they built it up again, and it stayed. So that's how they got through uh, the town meadow. Uh, this would be right behind the library. As we come down here, we have what is now Pleasant Street. I believe that this is Wade Place, but it's hard to say. Warren, uh, South Warren Street did not exist. North Warren did not exist. And Arlington Road did not exist. So all we have is Pleasant Street. We had a bridge here. The canal, canal came down. As you see, one, two locks here, double set. We have a basin, another double set of locks, another basin, another set of locks. And down here was the last lock, just below Horn Pond, where they could introduce water from Horn Pond. So again, this is actual field information. We know where the canal was. I still don't know what that other thing is. We've kicked it around in the office. We seem to believe that when people want to drain a swamp or when we're under construction trying to drain a swamp, they would dig these little canals as an outlet. I still don't know. I'm sorry, I wish I had an answer. If somebody does, maybe you could fill me in later. This is the 1966 topography. Here is the library. Here is the old railroad. Here is the town center. Here is City Hall. Here is that stream that bisects Old Library Field. The other one comes in over here. This is Harrison Ave. We believe that the canal ran right along that embankment down and down through here. The grades fit with the physical features that we see in the field, fit with the location the canal is. Little forensic engineering there. You may have known I didn't. This is a 1844 land court survey plan. Horn Pond. This is the Horn Pond Mansion, or what we refer to as Horn Pond Tavern. This is how it actually looked in 1844. Off to the right, we have gardens. Behind it, we have a dining hall. Over here, we have a bowling alley. Over here, we have a bowling alley. Here we have stables and an ice house and sheds. I think that one picture that we saw with the boat in the locks actually is mimicking um, the stables over here as opposed to the mansion, which was over here. The remnants of the mansion today are substantially less than what we see back in the mid-1800s. Uh, as you can see, we have the double locks. We have bridges across it. We have the basin, another set of double locks. Uh, this is not Hudson, Hudson Road. This was another road that existed at the time. Hudson Road is actually farther over here, as we'll show you. We had a pavilion. We had a bathhouse. We had a wharf. We have a culvert over here. Now, we believe that this culvert came from what's called a waste weir. As we'll talk about a little bit later, when we had surges of water in the canal, again, you had a, a lock that prohibited flow all the way down. So what you would get if you introduced too much water upstream would be a little tidal wave of about half an inch to an inch until it hit the lock. And then it would reverberate a, um, a wave back, a reflected wave, and you would get another surge. So they had these waste weirs, which were about the same elevation as the level of the waterway. If you got a surge, it would spill off to an adjoining stream. One of these actually existed up by School Street in behind the new subdivision that I think is called Canal Estates. But there was a waste weir up in that area where you could spill water off to Halls Brook. Now, what we did, just so that you can get a better feel for this, we superimposed this on the existing aerials for the city. This is kind of difficult, but as you can see, the existing um, Horn Pond Tavern is right there. And you can see how, how much larger it used to be. So they've really consolidated. A lot of the wings have been removed. The bowling alley, alley, yeah, excuse me, the bowling alleys are in where we have existing residences. The gardens are gone. Um, Alderman Tucci lives right here. That used to be a road. But again, when you look down here, we can see that the canal was just off to the side of the street. Uh, this is the edge of Horn Pond which really falls very, very close to what we see today. So again, 200 years ago is not that far off from, from what we now see. It's kind of interesting. 
This is a view that we took out of John McElhinney's uh, history book. This is from 19, uh, the early 1900s. Here is the Horn Pond Mansion in the background. As you can see, it's up on a hill. This would be Canal, then Canal Street. Uh, actually, it would be now be Allington Road, Canal Street in the uh, late, seven, late 1870s, and then Arlington Road. But you can see how flat it is compared to today. And as you look over here, everybody used the pond. I mean, this is a marvelous place for passive and active recreation. Kind of interesting. Since we see the started locks, and they are uh, one of the major magnitude items, uh, we'd like to talk about those. This is a sketch of a Baldwin woodlock. Uh, initially, when they were building the canals, all of the introduction locks from the Concord River into the main canal were constructed of stone, masonry. As they were building them, they found out the directors looked and they said, we're using a thousand ton of stone to build each one of these locks. We have to find a more economical, cost-effective way to do it. This was the first value engineering. Actually, what they did is cheapened it. As it turns out, they had to come back and redo them anyhow. But this was a lock that they were able to construct out of wood. It leaked notoriously, had a lot of leakage. But again, it was much less costly than the stone locks. This is what a typical lock would look like. Um, over here, we have a full lock. This is the upstream side. The point of the two locks always pointed to the upstream. They used the natural force of the water to hold the gates together. We'll go over that a little bit, a little bit in a moment. Very interesting. Again, you see these open locked here. They had these long paddles. That was to give a man the uh, fulcrum to get the mechanical movement to, to uh, work them. Here's a, uh, the upstream has been closed and the bottom has been opened. This is a better anim animation that we have, but I like this because up at the museum there is a wonderful uh, model of a lock from the period. And you really have to look at the lock gates to appreciate the effort that went into this. Somebody studied the, uh, the papers, uh, 1936, the started locks up at the uh, University Lowell Library in order to reproduce that. But it's a wonderful model. If uh, for something to see, you'll really appreciate it. Uh, these are hand sketched notes from Weston relative to details for building a lock gate. Unfortunately, they don't reproduce well and they're difficult to read. You'll have to go to the uh, University of Lowell Li Linden Library to see this if you want to where you can go to the museum and see their lock. Here we go. I stole this from the Erie Canal site, and I'm proud of it. What you see here is they open the downstream doors. The canal boat comes in. They close the downstream doors. They introduce water by opening a sluice gate in the gate. It raises the boat. Once the pressure is equalized, they bring it out. Now, we're talking about a big wood gate, 10 feet high, minimum of six and a half feet wide. It's built of double timbers, approximately six by six, weighed about 16 to 1,800 pounds. It's buoyant in water. It's sitting on a hinge. Now, the weight of that gate, the forces that without the, the water buoyancy to hold it up a little bit, and these long fulcrum paddles, a guy would get way out here, might have been two people, in order to break the bond and open it. It's really marvelous, because somebody had to sit down and do the calculations to figure this out. Now, some of the things that we've read, um, Leonardo da Vinci actually produced the first lock gates. He did that at about 1493, so they had something to fall back on. But again, it's marvelous. What you see, and we'll show it um, move on to, uh, here we go. This is a uh, detail of a, of a lock. This is one gate, and this is the other. Now you see this little door down here. That's sitting down about eight feet in the water. If it were a slide gate, even if it's one foot by one foot, and they were actually much larger, 
The fact that it's down eight feet, that's about four PSI of pressure acting over one square foot. That's about 500 pounds of, of pressure from the water holding that closed. They devised this little thing where it's a swinging door. So if you're looking down, this thing actually, that door right there actually pivoted to open. So all they had to do was remove this pin and the weight of the water would open that little door the upper lock would drain through and fill the lower lock. Sheer genius. As Einstein once said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. They followed that rule. Everything that they did was simplicity, and it was wonderful. <coughs> Again, we have another uh, typical lock gate detail. This one had two doors in the bottom. But you can see the mass of this door. And again, I, I mean, when you think of it, just under a ton. Absolutely massive things. The tools of the day, they had planes. To make things watertight was very, very difficult. They used pitch, and they used uh, different things. But when these things seated together, they had to marry very, very closely in order to give you a very good watertight seal. Typical section through the canal, as Bob has already said, about 30 foot wide at the top. 10-foot towpath, uh, three and a half feet of depth. And we have this puddled clay core, which when we do puddle dams, we still use this technique today. The problem was is that the clay that we had, everything was indigenous to the area where you worked. So if I'm the farmer who was given a contract to do um, 200 rods of canal, well, I have to go around and look for clay on my property. Well, the clay on my property might have more sand and silt than the clay on Joshua's property. So everybody did it differently. And again, as Bob said, nobody built canals in those days. Nobody had experience. It was on-the-job training at its finest. Some little facts. Length of the canal, in excess of 143,000 feet. Cross-sectional area of that, uh, that typical prism that we saw, 75 square feet at a depth of three feet. Because a half a foot of it had actually filled in with silt. It's because we don't have a lot of velocity in the canal. The velocity would have carried the silt away and kept it clean. But the, scout, the um, canal scows had to get down, dredge it out, throw it up on the sides, wait for it to rain, it would slough back in. Kind of a very labor-intensive type of thing. In the first 10 years, they spent oodles and oodles of time plugging leaks, again, because we didn't have a uniformity of material. Uh, as Bob said, they used, they invented, uh, created a material called talus, which was a type of cement which would cure in water. It was waterproof. Up until that time, the plasters and gypsums and things that we used to tack wood together would dissolve in water. So you'd put them out there, and next thing you know, it's gone. They had an ingenious material for patching holes in the sides. It was cow or horse manure mixed with clay. So you'd take this material, you'd slap it in there, the manure would dissolve, and the clay would fill the hole. Personally, I wouldn't want to have done that. Volume of the canal, approximately 80 million gallons. When you think that the um, uh, level of Horn Pond at 100 acres, 100 acre feet of water per foot is about 100 million gallons. I'm sorry, 10 million gallons gives you an idea of how much water was, was sitting in this canal. Again, the average canal slope hydraulically, seven hundredths of a foot. Seven hundredths of a foot is that much in 100 feet. Very, very small pitch. Um, water did not move unless you opened a lock or if you had a leak. Again, we had these waste weirs to take care of hydraulic transients or surges in water. Again, think about it. If I'm the gatekeeper up on the Concord River, sitting down, probably scanning the, oh, we didn't have the web. I might be reading a newspaper from England that was brought over three months ago because that's how, how long it took to get there and I'm finding about what's going on and I forget and I leave the weir open. Now I send a surge of water downstream. Well, I can't pick up the phone. 
I can't telegraph. I can't use the web. I can have Joshua get on the horse. Now, he might be able to get to the locks that started before the surge does. It's amazing what they had to do without general communications, without all the modern conveniences that we have today. So again, in the, they, as they encountered these things like surges, they would put in waste weirs and the like. They devised it on the run. Scouring velocities, as I said, we didn't have them. That's why they got siltation. And again, if you think about it, the velocity of the water going downhill, wonderful thing if you're the horse that's pulling the barge downhill. But if you've got a current going this way and you're going uphill, you're going to get tired real fast. Kind of like when you fly from here to California, pretty quick flight, coming back, not so much. You've got the wind in your face. Same type of thing there. So they tried to keep velocities to a minimum. Well, I, I think that I've covered all the little details. If I get into too much minutia, you won't be able to go to the museum and see all these wonderful things. And again, my friend John McElhaney, we should remember him for these wonderful things. Phil? <laughs> Follow me around. Oh, I'll take that too. That's easy. I'll take that too. See if I can get myself back to square here. So we're going to review Bob's show here. Take me a minute. And I want to thank Jay Corey for all the work he put into this. I don't, I mean, ask an engineer to look into it, an engineering marvel. And uh, he really took off with it. He spent countless hours on it, and we really appreciate everything you did. It was very interesting tonight, Jay. Thanks very much. I also want to thank Bob McGuire for his presentation tonight. I got daily emails from, uh, from Bob when I was on vacation. My phone would get an email, and my wife would say, is that Bob again? Because he worked on this every day, too, and I thank you very much for everything you did tonight, Bob. So before we finish, uh, we do have some additional photographs that you're definitely going to want to see. But I want to take a moment to thank a few people and organizations that helped us collect the information in tonight's presentation. So I just want you to consider this is that commercial break at the end of the show that you have to sit through to find out what happened to the characters. But it's important to thank these people. First, I want to thank the Wuben Public Library Board of Trustees and their director, Kathleen O'Doherty, for preserving uh, the treasures of the community in many ways, particularly what we have here tonight. I want to thank Tom Doyle, who is the diligent archivist of the Wuben Public Library. Tom poured through the collections of the library and prepared many of the images that you saw tonight. Without Tom's help, we would not have been able to assemble these items. I want to thank the Middlesex Canal Commission and the Middlesex Canal Association. The commission has been in existence for over 30 years and the association for nearly 50 years with the goal of preserving the heritage of the Middlesex Canal. The Middlesex Canal Museum and Visitor Center, which is located at 71 Faulkner Street in North Billerica. Billerica. They have visiting hours every Saturday and Sunday and many events throughout the year. There's information about the museum outside in the lobby, including information on becoming a member of the association. If tonight's program has piqued your interest in the canal, you'll find much more information at the museum. I also want to point out that Jay Corey has become a proprietor of the museum. Um, join their membership. That's how how much he got into this. I want to thank, as we did earlier tonight, Leonard Harmon, Woburn's longtime representative to the Middlesex Canal Commission and an important figure in the preservation of the canal's history as well as Woburn's history as past chairman of the Woburn Historical Commission. The Baker Library at the Harvard Business School in Cambridge where many of Loami Baldwin's papers relating to the canal are preserved. 
particularly want to thank Woburn City Engineers Department, including City Engineer Jay Corey, Assistant City Engineer Brett Gonzalez, and Senior Engineer Greg Room, who prepared much of tonight's presentation and conducted considerable research about the engineering of the canal, including those trips to the Baker Library and the Middlesex Canal Museum. The Woburn Historical Society for partnering with the Burbine Lecture Series tonight and for their continued good work in bringing Woburn's history to light. And finally, I want to thank the Woburn School Committee and the Woburn Public Schools and their staff for hosting these events for the benefit of the community. And as they say now, as they say now back to the show. Just as the canal was an advance in transportation designed to reduce the cost and speed of the delivery of goods to market, the canal was soon surpassed by the development of the railroad. Here you can see the clear layout of the canal in the shadow of the railroad bed just to the right. Ironically, the canal had a hand in its own demise, delivering the granite for the ties and the parts of the railroad engine itself along the waterway. And in a twist of fate, Loami Baldwin's son and namesake, Loami Baldwin II, known as the father of civil engineering, helped design the route of the railroad that passed so close to the canal his father had helped bring to light. Running parallel to the canal were the Boston and Lowell Railroad, were the Boston and Lowell Railroad, which was completed in 1835, and the Nashua and Lowell Railroad, which was completed in 1840. The railroad offered reliable transportation year-round, something the canal could not match. And soon the canal's revenues reduced to the point that it could no longer cover its costs. Here you can see the railroad barreling past the canal, clearly beating the canal's top speed, which we know was four miles an hour. In 1843, there was a proposal to sell the canal to be used as a method of supplying water to the city of Boston, which was experiencing a water shortage at the time. The idea was never adopted. Looking at this photograph of the canal running alongside of the railroad bed, it would seem that there would have been some water quality issues in any event. In 1846, the corporation began to sell its property while maintaining the right to use the canal for transportation purposes. In 1851, the last boat trip between Boston and Lowell was made along the, the old canal. In April 1852, the canal was used for the last time by any boat. Later in 1852, the corporation began filling in portions of the canal. The days of the canal as a route between Boston and points north had ended. In 1854, the corporation held its last formal meeting. This photograph, in a way, represents the erosion of the canal over time. On October 3rd, 1859, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, the same court you will recall, James Sullivan, a principal proponent of the canal, once served on as a justice, declared that any persons pretending to hold the privileges, franchises, and liberties of the old corporation do not in any manner hold or enjoy such privileges and liberties and were forjudged and excluded from doing so. By act of the legislature on April 4th, 1860, the general court declared all of the former rights of the corporation seized into the hands of the Commonwealth and forfeited for the nonfeasance and misfeasance of the corporation and the neglect of their corporate duties. Strong words. And with that, the Middlesex Canal began to slowly ebb into history and literally sink back into the earth. Here you will see the faded remnants of a portion of the canal. And off to the right, Past the fence in the berm, you see the raised railroad bed. You can't blame the railroad for the, the demise of the canal any more than you can blame the interstate highway system for the decline of the railroad. This was merely an advance in transportation brought on by advances in technology, the ingenuity of engineers, and the American spirit to always improve their lot, to go faster and at greater savings, in essence, in the pursuit of happiness. But the old canal refuses to go away. Always present in spirit, there was a concerted effort to recognize the benefits of the canal in engineering, transportation, and in the development of the young nation. And while John Hancock, the first governor of the Commonwealth, signed the legislation that established the proprietors of the Middlesex Canal in 1793, here is a photograph of the 65th governor of the Commonwealth riding a packet boat in a newly established Middlesex Canal Park in North Woburn in 1976. 
The Middlesex Canal was declared a National Civil Engineering Landmark in 1967, and portions of the canal have been listed on the National Register of Historic Places since 1972, thanks to the dedicated work of the members of the Middlesex Canal Association. And I want to point out, I believe that's the accommodation bridge that we kept talking about tonight, the buttress of the accommodation bridge for the Baldwin Mansion. We end tonight with a portion of a poem called Our Old Canal, published in the Woburn Journal, which was a newspaper published in Woburn between 1873 and 1913. Thou old canal, thou old canal, O oh, who my grief can tell, as from my heart I bid thee now a long, a sad farewell. Thank you and good night.